Today we're going to visit a World War II museum a friend of mine in Denmark is building up. He's also the curator of a Cold War bunker which turned into a museum. It was exactly the way it was left at the end of the Cold War. And there's a very specific reason I'm taking you back to this place. Because next week we are going to visit the Polish exact equivalent to this. And you better remember the Cold War because our politicians seemingly are doing everything they can to bring it back for a rematch. But it was decades of living with the possibility of a nuclear holocaust for breakfast. World War III tomorrow always around the corner. And some of you young ones out there they don't have no idea how close we got to the brink on several occasions, more than you would think. And what we had planned if the balloon went up. Thousands of bunkers, munition stores and CPs were built throughout Europe and America and Russia. Always ready to accommodate military, police, emergency services and civil government to hide underground in a nuclear bomb shelter, still run the country and from there handle emergencies and still fight the war. Visiting these is a fascinating step back in time with many, many lessons learned from World War II. So today we'll visit both a World War II German command bunker and a Cold War CP, where nothing has changed since. Even the phones are back from the 1970s. First, let's visit a World War II German airfield command bunker. And here are some really neat details that I haven't seen anywhere else. In April 1940, Germany invaded and occupied Denmark. And it wasn't soon after the Germans arrived before they started building, constructing bunkers, guarding for the Allied subsequent invasion that they expected. And of course, they also built airfields. Wenige Minuten später überfliegen planmäßig Einheiten der deutschen Luftwaffe die Hauptstadt Dänemarks. Sie werfen Flugblätter ab, die die Bevölkerung darüber aufklären. Wenig später ist auch die von deutschen Ingenieuren erbaute Weltbrücke, die bei Mittelfahrt Jütland mit Hünen verbindet, in unserer Hand. In rascher Fahrt geht es von den Bahnstationen zu den in kürzester Zeit ausgebauten Geschützstellungen an der dänischen Küste, die jede feindliche Landung unmöglich machen werden. In 1943, as the war effort began to turn against Germany, orders were given to fortify the country further. New airfields and bunkers were to be constructed. And in the small town of Beldringen on Fühn, the Germans paid off all the local inhabitants to get out so they could build a huge airfield with fortified German command bunkers. One of the things the Germans did whenever they got somewhere is they started building things. They built runways, they built roads, they built buildings, barracks, bunkers, bunkers everywhere. And a lot of these things like this, you can't just move it or rebuild it. Uh, a lot of the roads were just repaved over the years, but they started as German roads. The Germans built their way through World War II. And here you have at the airport, you've got this big command bunker, and there's whole this area was under German control. And the interesting thing is they never really fenced it in with barbed wire. So the resistance sort of could come through. The local train from one end of the Denmark to the other went right through. So they would just jump on the train and go right to the airport, take pictures, do some sabotage, but we'll talk about that more when we get to the museum. Let's... And as we're walking into the forest, you just see remnants of World War II everywhere. So I'm guessing this was the defensive area for the next bunker. Yes. So every yes. bunker had its little circle of barbed wire and, yeah. and guards. Yeah. And this is where that started. Yeah. Right. And minefields. Yeah. I'm guessing. Those minefields, yeah. I ain't gotta have landmines. <laughs> <laughs> and those forests like this in here, or was this in the open air? It was in the open air. Yeah. Okay. But these things were built to, to withstand bombs and yeah. shells and... Yeah. The walls are three meters thick 
and also the roof it's um, it's thicker than normal the normal size of uh, a World War II bunker is two meters but here on uh, in Belbring it's uh, three meters because they couldn't get it underground the the soil is too moist so they built them on the ground and the if the war was con uh, continuing they even would have uh, built uh, slope soil. yeah soil okay yeah. So everything, pretty much, it's sitting out in the open, so you can see it from the air. Yeah. So we built it because we expect someone's going to bomb it, and they're going to make it. They built them to last. Yeah. So all these mounds of dirt around here, is that just built up later, or yeah, is that... Later, Every time I'm in the forest in Europe, I see a mound of dirt or a hole in the ground. I'm like, bomb crater? <laughs> is that a running trench? What is that? What could that have been? Oh, you, your pipes just burst. All right, that's not interesting. Never mind. <laughs> We've all seen the World War II films where the GIs that crawl on top of the bunker and dump in a grenade. Now, the Germans knew this was a possibility, so they built fake ventilation shafts. Some of them are real, some of them are fake. And some of the real ones inside have a little tube so a grenade will roll back, back out. It was really well thought through. And I always said that the Germans had a plan for exactly wherever they went. When they got there, they had made the plan of what they were going to build, where the guns were going to be pointing. Nothing was left to chance. In the main room of the command and control bunker by the airport, there's some really interesting features that you haven't seen a whole lot of places. Jens, why don't, let's, let's go talk about this. Here in one of the main rooms where they had a whole lot of equipment sitting, and what do they do? Here they have their communication, uh, wireless and also telephones with the wires so you can couple up to, uh, ex ex for example, Germany or other bunkers here in Denmark. But here, uh, because of all the electronics uh, that was in this room, they had to have some um, uh, special floor. Uh, it was made of uh, asphalt and uh, rubber. Because there was so uh, the static electricity was so heavy that the, the German soldiers uh, get headaches and stuff. There was so much learning going on with so much new technology that we're, we're looking at today like, that we just take for granted. That with all the insulation and wires and materials, and we know how it is to live in bunkers. But we know because the Germans sort of figured it out. And also because we, even in Denmark it gets really, really cold, so you see that when they build the bunkers, they put wood in here. This is one of the few bunkers I've seen where you have the wood built into the bunker walls, where then you insulate the whole thing with a uh, with wood wood yeah. paneling, and uh, it's nice little details. It's a really cool place. This is pretty much how it looked yeah. at that time. Yeah, and uh, the the roof there was some. Uh, what do you call it, sticks or, or uh, some kind of, uh, yeah, wooden sticks to damp the, the what do you call moist? No, the, the, the voice. Oh, the voice, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. And there's another thing the wood would do, it would, would, would keep it from resonating because it gets yeah. kind of, it gets loud in here. Yeah. And everybody was separated, have a little slit there for passing papers into uh, the officers' quarters. You had two officers, one commanding in here. And have interesting samples of barbed wire from that time. And I can't wait. You guys are going to restore this whole thing, this whole area. Yeah. For several billion kroners. <laughs> I do hope so. <laughs> Donations are welcome. Yeah. And if you happen to have a spare tank or vehicle or plane, please donate it here because it's going to have a nice, really nice place to sit. This was an airport during World War II that the Germans started building late 44. Uh, they kicked out all the Danish inhabitants and um, moved in 800 troops. And at the end of the war, a whole lot of planes from uh, Prussia came over and landed here. So you had a whole lot of different planes sitting on the tarmac, all different types. And that must have been an interesting thing to see. Yeah, and it was destroyed. The, the British came and uh, what do you call it? 
looked at all the plane and took the good ones, the special ones, to back to uh, to Britain and uh, destroyed the rest. Here in Denmark, there was a thousand of planes, very good planes we could have used. Thanks, British <laughs> allies. And up here, you got the periscope that I don't think I've been digging through bunkers since I was five. I've never seen a functioning periscope and here they will have one and they'll install it when they put it all together and I want to come and I want to look through that because that was just a lot of the bunkers they had in there they had the periscope sitting so they could sit down here watch what's going on and I've never seen one functioning so I'm looking forward to that. You gotta love guys and our toys that are loud and but this is where the guys served. And in here, you're gonna have a little machine gun, access control. And he's gonna put another machine gun in here that semi functions. How many people worked in here? Uh seven to nine people. It was a kind of uh there were they were workplace and when they had their 12 hour shift they get, get back to uh, Elsu to uh, write to their uh, girlfriends or make their socks or something like that and a new uh, team okay. would came up. So 8 to 12 is that including the security detail? No, just in this bunker. Okay, then they had the yeah. guard then the guard detail. Yeah. But this is I I love it because it's still original of what it sort of what it was. And you gotta love these places. And here again, access control to the main entrance to the bunker. And you come out here, and you see the big boy. I keep asking myself why I keep doing this and I keep forgetting a flashlight, because it's not like it's not dark in here. <laughs> but it's dry, it's clean, it's above the water line, which is cool. And hear the echo. So imagine if you had 12 people working in here and machines and radios going. That's why you want to insulate the walls and uh, the ceilings so the voices don't carry. After all, we've got to keep secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I got another secret out here. Ah. The passageway to an underground hangar. Passageway to underground hangar. But it's do you got your scuba dive gear? I, I will next time. What is uh, underground? Uh, it's a joke. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we talk about how, how far the Germans were, look at this. That's central heating. That's central heating. This is how, this is how you run a war. In the cold, you have central heating. Not the little ovens. So, and this was built in late 44 when resources were scarce. Germans still knew what they were doing, and they built quality to last. And it's Every year, the museum plays host to a vast variety of living history events. World War II aircraft will land, reenactors will show up with vehicles, tents, and bring in weaponry and uniform of the day, so you can get a real feel for what it really was like back in the day, without anybody shooting at you. You should bring your kids so they can see and learn. This is how we tell the next generation all about it. It's a great place, it's a great museum, great events, great people. So come on out. And also, if you have a spare tank or an old World War II aircraft, they would love to have it sitting out here. All right, now we're back to the flag thing. Ever since Brothers War, we had joked about the 50-star flag. Here is a real World War II flag with 48 stars. The Germans used this when they buried American airmen shot down. So the Germans actually gave the American airmen a proper ceremony when they were shot down over here, over Denmark, and they used this flag with 48 stars. Now we know to get one, so no more comments about the wrong flag, Professor.
one of the things you'll know about Denmark if you are a fisherman, you really don't want to catch one of these mustard gas bombs that was dumped overboard everywhere in the Danish oceans. My, my granddad was the head of the shipyard of an, of an Aalborg. Mustard gas bombs, always in the fishing nets. That's what they look like. Where did this thing come from? It was uh, actually, it, it was going to be carried out to, uh, or sailed to Norwegian for, uh, against the inv invasion. But uh, the, the little uh, ship it was on, uh, it was carrying about a uh, hundred of these uh, empty cases of uh, okay. bombs, air, aerial bombs. And then the, the ship was attacked by uh, American uh, day fighters and uh, the ship was sunk. And those who uh, was floating, was floating in towards the land and uh, a Danish, um, what do you call it, farmer, and took it and put it up in his uh, Attic, and uh, several years uh, uh, later, the son uh, came and uh, thought, oh, "Well, this bump, I have to get it uh, to my place." And he put it in his back of his uh, car and drove to Woodense and uh, put it in his garage. And uh, there it stood for many years again. And uh, someday he thought, "Maybe, maybe I got to have a permission for that." And then uh, he called uh, the Danish army. And got somehow he 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 he, uh, he was coming through to a, an answer phone or phone answering machine, and then he said to the machine, "Hello, uh, I have this uh, 250 kilo uh, mustard gas bomb in my <laughs> in my garage. I just want to know." Uh, Ten minutes later, <laughs> the Danish army called him. Clear the area, <laughs> run! <laughs> he said, "Take it easy, take it easy. I think it's empty." <laughs> <laughs> the, the Danish uh, frog team came and uh, with some uh, stuff, the, the yeah. salmon. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, out. who doesn't want to have a bomb in the garage? In fact, during the Second World War, chemical weapons were never used in battle after the horrific memories and effect of their use during the First World War. However, chemical weapons, as we know, were always present, just in case. And in 1943, at the Italian port of Bari, an unintended release of chemical weapons happened as the St. John Harvey, a U.S. World War II liberty ship, was bombed by German aircraft. It was secretly carrying a huge cargo of mustard gas shells. But because the Allies wanted to keep it a secret, they never disclosed their deadly cargo to any of the firefighters or seamen who were fighting the blaze. That resulted in further injuries and hundreds of deaths. So was this the radio tower for the bunker over here? No, no, no. It's the Odin Tower um, in Odense. It was uh, North, Northern Europe's uh, highest tower built of leftovers from Little Bell Bridge. Oh! Yeah. Oh. But the German anti-terror corps uh, blew it up. They blew up their own tower? Oh, it was a Danish tower. Yeah, Danish tower. Oh, okay, yeah, so yeah, we built, they yeah. blew it up. Okay, well, yeah, right. well, that makes perfect sense. So... This is all the, the, the what do you call it? Airmen? Yeah, who vanished over, uh, over Fyn. Flight Lieutenant Pirouard was uh, in his um, Sterling, short Sterling bomber on a mission to uh, Kiel, I think, and uh, was attacked by uh, night fighters and shot down uh, near Middelfart. That's a funny name, but it's, that's the name of it, mm -hmm. Middelfart. And was crashed. Uh, seven of his uh, crew members was uh, killed, and um, also Pirois, and we got his uh, cross. Yeah. Got to remember the thing about wars. People, they die. Yeah. This whole clean, nice, non-lethal munition type of war. Yeah, I gotta win a war that way. German uh, propaganda radio. Goebbels uh, thought that uh, propaganda was the better way to, to inform people about the uh, Nationalist Party and, and their yeah, philosophy, sick philosophy. They uh, produced uh, three millions of these kinds of small radios and uh, so People could listen to music and also Nazis propaganda. It's called a Goebbels Schnauze. <laughs>
and there's a little uh, if you look at the scalar you can only receive german stations no bbc no no <laughs> there was a note here saying if you're listening to bbc it's you get punished and uh, <laughs> your health is not good and that was the thing everybody listened to the bbc both for the news and for the music secretly hiding in their attic, sitting somewhere or, or down low. And I, I remember all the stories from, from Europe. Everybody was sort of trying to get it, mostly for the music. Yeah. <laughs> this was instant news and instant information. The old teletyper, the telefax, came the fax machine. This is how you would tweet back in the day. If you're 19, you don't get it. I get it. This is how you would have a typical little home, um, typical little resistance home, where part of the resistance was spreading uh, information and propaganda to the other side, and had the little prints. And obviously, if you were caught in your house with one of these things, you would have a very bad time. And it's really, this is fun for me because my granddad, after the war, built a little summer house and had one of these and one of these and one of these and one of those uh, sitting in the summer house and even a rack with different plates. I recognize a lot of these things from when I grew up, which is actually kind of freaky, but kind of cool. All right, guys, here. <clears throat> um, don't know how we got to talk about toilet paper back in the day, which was invented. I think it was first reference was year 385. Toilet paper, back in the day. Um, I'm not that old, but I remember when uh, school I went to uh, had this shiny on one side and sandpaper on the other side. So actually sit and you, the World War II toilet paper. You were lucky when you had it. In the 80s when you had it, you didn't feel so lucky. If you still see it today, you're just shit out of luck. And during the war, Pretty much everywhere that was occupied or there was fighting, there was rationing of all different sorts of things. Uh, rubber and food and sugar and leather. And so you start improvising. This, these shoes are actually made from fish. From one of the flat fish that we have so many of out here. It's hard to ration fish when you have a whole sea full of them. But this is, this is interesting. I've never seen shoes made of uh, not even scale. And flatfish don't have scale. They have skin, like a yeah. thick skin like, like a snake. This is, this is interesting. This is really cool. You really get to improvise through hard times. And I can only recommend, at some point in time, when you raise your kids, give them a couple of weeks of hard times where they learn how to improvise and take the phone away and see how you do without Twitter. Now, I went to school um, out here in Denmark during the very latter stages of the Cold War. And it's, it's one of those things that's really remote for you teenagers today, especially in America. You don't, everything's so far away, you don't care about history. But back then, every Wednesday, you tested the air raid or the emergency sirens, um, which looked like this. And um, I got to tell you, I'm uh, going to crank it up for you. Every Wednesday, this is, this is kind of what, we, uh, what we were listening to. Wednesday, 12 o'clock, these were tested for a minute, set your watch by it, and we did. Just a reminder that shit could happen and you needed to be prepared for it. And I gotta tell you, with the recruits we have today, you whine about shit being heavy. You take one of these things and you take that in the battle with all the ammo, what they would carry back in the day, I will not hear you whining about things being too heavy. So again, so what are we looking at here? Some uh, stuff that was uh, dropped down from the British under the, uh, the occupation, of course. It's for the Danish, re uh, what do you call it? Resistance. Resistance. Yeah. U.S. carabine, Sten guns, Bryn guns, and uh, 
old American rifles. And they would drop these canisters yeah. with weapons and explosives, yes. radios, yeah. Yeah. ammunition, and so forth. This, uh, this, uh, what do you call it? Burning fuses. It's still functioning. It can burn underwater and, uh, yeah, it still works. All over occupied uh -huh. Europe, the Allies would drop everything from single shot revolvers to all the weapons, all the different resistance groups, and they would go wreak some havoc and, on the Germans and blow things up and do some assassinations and all those nasty things. And there's a really interesting story that we're going to go to. It's telling me about the, uh, the priest resistance fighter. Got to go hear that story. The priest, also referred to as the dynamite priest. His little group blew this thing up with one of the trolley cars that was used out here by the airport. The local pastor Peterson, he got a little group together and um, started blowing up German armaments and trains and rails and whatever he did. And There's a movie in that. There, there just has to be. Now, during the Cold War, just like World War II, um, they built bunkers in, for the civilian population in every city. Every major city, every big town had bunkers during the World War, during the Cold War. But now we are literally in the middle of nowhere. We're a very small town. How many people live here? 50. 50 people. There's a civilian bunker they built out here in the middle of nowhere for the Cold War. That's sitting right here. And we don't really know why. Do we know why? We do. Any idea? Yeah. And it's not it's not a post World War II German build. No, it's Danish standard. They built this Danish standard for the Cold War, literally in the middle of nowhere, for the civilian population. And we don't know why. And that's very interesting. And it's open, which is more interesting. So now we are looking for your flashlight. <laughs> There's some interesting thing uh, here because the bunker was uh, gas, anti-gas protected. They had a device inside they could turn around, so they suck uh, air from the outside into the bunker, and it was ventilated through a sand, big sand filter. Look. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The air get through and was cleaned. They hoped. They hoped. Yeah. So do we know what year this was built? Uh, in the 50s. In the 50s. That's interesting. I mean, the Cold War was just really heating up. And you see this round building. It's not very big. You could maybe uncomfortably sit 40 people in here. 50. 50. On benches. I was guessing on the 40. This is the emergency exit. And you're kind of looking at this bunker with a hole in the roof. This was not a like a military bunker that was expecting impact on top of it. This was a bunker that would withstand a blast somewhere yeah. on the side. A little, and it was it was a dome, yeah. which is always stronger, as we know. It arches. A D ray kit could not withstand it. It would uh, collapse. Yeah. As this is an uh, over uh, what do you call over pressure valve. Yeah. yeah. This is this is interesting. More to the story of why this thing is here. And these were built all over the landscape during the Cold War in, big in the big cities. Not out here, in the middle of small town 50 people. The story will continue when we figure it out, if we do. It was not long after the end of the fighting of the Second World War before the former ally turned on one another, when it became apparent that Stalin had no intentions of giving up any of the claims to the territory that he had conquered. It was with great effort the Cold War now, armed with nuclear weapons, many, many of them, did not turn hot. Instead, a whole lot of small proxy wars were fought by the former allies all around the world. And in the middle of those, there was always the possibility of the Cold War turning hot. In East and West, bombers were always ready, loaded with nuclear bombs, just waiting for the word to go. 
And in the middle of this, every small and large European country would build fortified bunkers in order to cope with the possibility of a nuclear war or a Russian invasion, the very, very real threat that the Cold War would turn very hot right on top of them. Here in Denmark, there are 125 of those command centers, ready, manned, to cope with a Russian invasion or nuclear war, and visiting them is a fascinating snapshot of the past, which is really not that long ago. In the middle of a small Danish town, little houses, been here for a while, and over here is the school, and under the school is a big Cold War bunker. Now, during the Cold War, it was expensive back then to build these big installations that were in under every major city there was a command center. Um, something that was a remnant of how the Germans had warning command centers during the war. It was adapted for the Cold War because it worked. And of course, if you have to build a huge underground bunker, build it under something you're already going to build, like a school or a hospital, that's also prone to maybe not be the first thing on a bombing run. See this? That doesn't belong for a school. See the, see the antennas up here? Most schools don't have those. Now you got a little hole in the ground. Most schools don't have these. These were built in preparation for if the Cold War went hot, manned by 20 people in times of crisis, actually 40, but 20 active. Nuclear-free zone in Danish. And you see, this is a bit newer in the construction than what we're used to seeing in the World War II German bunkers. And these are roughly put in, in every major city or a city of, we have industry that was important, or bridge, connection, something where, where you needed to be able to command and control crisis, invasion, or literally waiting for the Russians to come. This is a remnant of the Cold War. There's 125 of these waiting for the day that the Russians might come. And this is where the battle would be guided from, or the disaster as... Yeah, the civil, civil defense force. Some of the things that was operational all the way through the Cold War was a direct lineage from some of the things the Germans developed in their bunker warfare. Uh, not quite as thick, not expected a direct impact. However, this would survive a Hiroshima-sized nuclear device within 400 meters okay. from here. Yeah. And of course, under pressure, people are supposed to live here for 30 days. That's the thickness of the wall. Yeah, and also here. So you have this the outside, and now you're coming, this is the airlock, and then the actual inside bunkers are in here. In case the, the city net went down, this could provide um, power and uh, electricity for the bunkers function, radios, heating, food, and everything. And it was almost expected that you know, this was in time of war, so things would stop working, that we were expecting the Russians to, to, to bomb and land, maybe nuclear bombs would go off, you'd be hiding here, you'd command and control, so obviously you'd have your own, your own power station, your own water for a, limit for a while. There was uh, fuel for 30 days, water uh, storage for 1,200 liters for 40 people in 30 days, not much. Not much, no, no showers. No showers. Have a look and see what we get. And here's the double doors. You can actually feel the airlock. And this whole thing, and you come in here, this is nicer and cleaner than the German bunkers we're used to seeing. But this is cool. You come in here, can, you can hear the air. What you're trying to do is generate pressure inside the bunker to keep air out, keep dirty air out, nuclear air, uh, in case you had a chemical attack. And if there's a blast outside, you have these, would alleviate the pressure and then shut you'd have enough diesel to run the generator for 30 days. And this, we've seen enough German bunkers 
This, you recognize. You know exactly what this is with hand crank in case you have to clean the air. You know, supplies, you have to have supplies. 30 days, I don't know how much concentrated tomato soup uh, you can eat for 30 days. This is exactly, this is how it was. Supply, and in here, signal communications with all the equipment that was present during the Cold War. From the typewriters to the teletext to the computer of the day. And this is really interesting. Here's a map over Denmark, divided in the, in the regions, seven regions, a little island out there. And if there was an overflight, disaster, there was something to report, there was a police officer that would sit here and operate, and he would light up the different sections as a plane would go over, call it on, call it off. Uh, signals to the people in the second room, this one? Yeah. This was the signal to the guys in the next room that a change was made or deleted from the map. Because underneath every one of these stations, there was a Danish national radio station, transmitter, under, they had their own bunker underground, so they could keep transmitting. So you had an actual radio that would transmit news as much as they could for as long as they could. And hiding behind the radio, see the little box back there? That was a secret. You know when your high-tech radio on your new car stops playing music and you get a alert of an accident or, or something? That little thing that does that, they had that back then. And now we're looking back at the 60s. And you had the old teletext, get messages coming to and from that would be communicated around. I'm back in the day. With the little hole punch cards. This is the next step of what you had seen during World War II. You'd have volunteers would be sitting here taking calls from the the population at large, from the city outside, calling in, and all this would be coordinated. And all these rooms are exactly identical to the other 125 command and control bunkers throughout the entire country. And you, c you can actually hear the pressure. So nothing from the outside comes in. Map of the area. You come in here. This is where staffs of the, the government would sit. You have the police would sit here. You probably have some from the mayor's office. You have some from the hospital, uh, the National Guard, the operational section. You had, this is, the, this is the brain of the area. And on the other side, here's the map that's mirrored on the other side, same as with the radio. So this is the situation room. And we come down here. This is so, and this is so hardcore, low tech, and you sit to go like, oh, we used to look at uh, videos from NORAD and all the big computer screens. When NORAD goes down to an EMP, and your cell phone's up working and all that crap doesn't work when shit happens, this will work. This communication will still work. To, this will still work today if we really had to. This is how you'd, you'd signal here you had your squad cars. There's a unit, got called in. You'd move the, you'd, you'd take the sign and you'd move him over, over here and you'd write where he went. When he's done, he would radio in here on the road, on the way home. And finally, back here, he's back home. This is how you kept track of where your squad cars were, or the civil defense forces. Overhead projector. Most of you kids today don't know what an overhead projector is. You may have seen a blackboard. And if back then, back here, you wouldn't have a Wikipedia or Google if you needed some information. You'd go to the books. This is the Wikipedia of the day and you'd look up if you needed some information. In here, you're supposed to be hot bunking. They would have beds in here. The emergency exit, just like the World War II bunkers, they, all the Germans, made a little exit. This is a little more comfortable, filled with sand. So if shit happened and you had to get out that way, you'd dig your way out. You got the sounds of war going on out there. You would occupy this and be operational if the Russians uh, crossed the border, started the overflights, in the uh, in the 50s, they're actually activating the bunker down here. Is that correct? 
in anticipate after the uh, Russians went in uh, Eastern Europe. So you had people sitting down here. What about during the uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis? I don't know. I, I think they went uh, to a high alert state. It's scary to think that in 1952, only seven years after the World War II, barely during the, the Korean War, we were so sure that the Cold War with the Russians was going to turn hot. 1952, we were printing ration stamps, preparing to have to hand them out. They're sitting in a bunker up here. We are on, on, on Fun. But in 1982, during the NATO exercise called April Archer, so much communication had gone on with the NATO. And remember, everybody was spying on everybody. Had Russian spies everywhere, had American spies everywhere. Everyone was spying on everybody. The Russians were so sure because of this massive NATO exercise here in, in Europe that we were actually preparing to launch an attack. The Russians actually had their planes loaded with fuel and nuclear weapons ready on the tarmac. They had guys watching the launch sites just to see if we went hot. That's how sure they were that we were going to actually attack. And that kind of scared us so much that the ration stamps, instead of sitting in one bunker, they were actually distributed to different ones so they wouldn't all get destroyed at the same. There's a lot of instances in history where the Cold War was really on the brink, and you've never heard about it. That's interesting about history. There's a lot of things you haven't been told, you don't know, or you have to dig through places like this to learn. And you need to, and you need to bring your kids here because they need to know exactly what we came from and what could have happened. Speaking of, go to YouTube. Check out the Norwegian incident. Speaking of times where the Cold War almost went south. Look, this is so rudimentary, but it will work. And it will work if we ever need it to again. Nothing more, and then you get a little bit of sample of Russian uniforms, because Russia was the hardcore enemy of the day. And a bomb-proof toilet. Nuclear safe. <laughs> of course, you had a little canteen, you have to eat. You had diesel, you had food, you had air, you had water. Just no long showers, that you could sustain life and operate. And the Russians were so prepared that you go through Eastern Europe, you go to, you go to old East Germany, you go to Poland, you'd on the basis when the wall came down, you'd find street signs in preparation of the Russian invasion of Europe that they were going to advance and pluck the street signs and change the names of all the streets so they could find their way around. And they had invasion plans, nuclear plans. They knew exactly what they were going to do, um, where they were going to go, and uh, we did what we could to to prevent that. The Cold War was a, was a very strange time that I think most teenagers today they don't really understand. So what Jens is going to do is turn this into a active museum. Yeah. We can bring school classes in here and and show them what it was and yeah. listen and learn. Like put them in the scenario where, where some of the pupils are the mayor and the policeman and some from the home guard and so forth, and then they have to run through a scenario of uh, crisis and, and war. We're not that old, but we still remember the tail end of that history of knowing that shit could happen. And if you learn these ways of communication, if it's the, the old teletext or the old um, <laughs> the rotary phone or the old radios. If you can survive with Morse code and you can live of, of the land, so to speak, and communicate in command and control with a map and a compass, then you have a chance because we are so dependent on electronics today. All it takes is a little EMP and you got no electronics, you got no cell phone, you got nothing. And I was scared when I saw some of the recruits in basic, basic training. Didn't you learn map and compass? Because they had a GPS. Remember, electronics will fail you when you absolutely need them. And then you're moving back down here. And then you have to know how to learn and survive on the basic skills of having to break out if the walls crumble around you. We had guys down by the water with these to measure the wind distance, the direction, 
so they could report how strong the wind was, what direction it was going, in case there was a nuclear cloud coming from, say, the main island, Shelland, that had been a nuclear explosion, see if it was just drifting this way or the other way. And I remember vaguely during uh, the incident at Chernobyl when the Soviet nuclear reactor went sideways and we started measuring these increased levels of radioactivity here. And one of the things we were issued in the army back then was also was uh, the, the trace paper that you have to had to put on you so you could see if you were near radia radiation and I believe chemical as well. And this little thing was for the small civilian shelters to create pressure to keep the dirty air out. You would connect this to a hose like the like like the shelter we went to would have some of the one of these sitting there so you could manually generate pressure inside and keep the dirty air out. To think that for all those decades, people were ready to go underground all over the world, waiting just for war. And now here again we are, seeing the walls go up, bunkers being built, and a new arms race slowly beginning, seemingly having learned nothing at all from the past. So I will just have to continue to remind the next generation of what was. And next we are going to Poland to visit an almost identical setup there and getting the tour by those who operated it during the Cold War while Poland was planning to invade and occupy Denmark, as a matter of fact. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebnus nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive. My PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.